it's more than just salvation. It's more than just redemption, Father God, and it's ruling and reigning with you. And as we look at what that looks like, Father, tonight, I just ask that you just expound our, the way we think and the way we understand the, so that we can start to see through your lens, so we can start to see the way you see, so that we can catch your vision of what you created us to be. In the name of Jesus, amen. Hey, um, okay, so uh, tonight we're actually going to um, talk about how to be the best dressed in the kingdom. And in um, Isaiah 61.3 is actually the um, quote that Jesus read from when he was in Nazareth. And after he read it, he said, today is, this is fulfilled in your hearing. And one of the things that is in there is, um, or actually two of the things we're going to be talking about. The first is a crown of beauty instead of ashes. A crown, I want you to hear that, a crown. And then a garment of praise instead of despair. So we know from that scripture alone that we have spiritual crowns and we have spiritual gowns. And so um, we want to look at what those look like. Um, in, the, in Luke 15, um, and we're going to be hopping a little bit today, so don't, don't feel like um, I've forgotten about Ephesians. We, this is still an Ephesians Bible study, but uh, I just want to take some time and, and kind of flesh out what we're talking about in general for the last couple of weeks and what we're going to be moving into later. So in Luke 15, the prodigal uh, son story appears and starts in verse 11. And we've heard this before. Um, the younger man, a man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his dad, hey, give me my inheritance now. And the dad said, sure, here you go, here's your half. And the guy, the younger man went out and he lived it up large, hearty, hearty. And then when it was all spent, when all of his friends were gone, when all the revelry was over, all he had left was the, uh, just himself. Like there was nothing left of the money. All of his friends left. He's now feeding pigs. He decides, okay, I need to get up, go back home. Maybe I can be a servant because even a servant eats better. But what I love is when he starts to come back, it says um, in verse 20, And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put him on it, Put it on him, put on the rings on his hands and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf, kill it, let us eat and be merry. For my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, and they began to be merry. So, um, you know, verse 22, quick, bring a robe and put it on and put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. You know, um, this is the Lord, uh, you know, a, a, a parable of the Lord dressing us. We once were dead in our sins, we were once dead in our trespasses, but now we're clothed, we have shoes on our feet, we have a rope on our back, we have rings on our hands, God taking care of us. I think it's so funny that I, that I teach on this, because I don't care about clothes very much, I don't care about um, jewelry very much, and I used to have a thing for shoes, but now because my feet are... <laughs> my feet are um, little temperamental I don't get to wear them very much but I do notice them so but you know I get to teach about putting on you know different garments and for me it just seems so weird because I hate going shopping I hate um, trying on clothes it is probably the most frustrating experience and it has nothing to do with my size or not being able to find clothes it is just hot and yucky and time-consuming and I really just want to be able to be one of those people that walks in goes yes this is what I want and walks out but you know you can't do that when it comes to clothes you have to take the time and I think it is so special that God's taken the time to be our personal spiritual private shopper and he has already gone out and said this is the robe I want for my child and this is the ring and these are the shoes and I'm gonna put it on her 
I think that that is just amazing. So, and I'm all for <laughs> personal shoppers. <laughs> um, so, I want us to turn to Zechariah 3, 4. And Zechariah is one of those small, lesser prophets that's kind of hard to find. He's towards the back of the Old Testament. Um, if you're having problems, he's right after Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. So almost the very end of the New Testament. So if you find Matthew, you can go back and find him. All right. So I want to just explain when I start reading this, every time I say the word Joshua, I want you to think Israel. And when I say, when you hear angel of the Lord, I want you to think Jesus. And when you hear accuser or Satan, of course, think accuser or Satan. And he showed, and this is Zechariah speaking, he's having a, a vision, a, a dream. And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even the Lord has chosen Jerusalem, that has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not the brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments, and he stood before the angel of the Lord. And he answered and spoken to those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused your iniquity to pass from you, and I will clothe you with a change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head. So they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall also keep my cords, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, that thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. Behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, Jesus. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I shall engrave the engraving thereof, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity that is in the land. And in that day, says the Lord, they shall call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. I love this because this is a picture of what it is like for uh, what our spiritual condition was before Jesus. We were filthy, and you can see in uh, in verse 4 that he, he, we were clothed with filthy garments. And the Lord actually tells them, take away all of those filthy garments, all of that iniquity, take it away, and set a fair mitre upon his hair, head. And fair, uh, a mitre, fair just as a descriptive word, pretty, you know, nice, <coughs> Pardon me. But mitre is the spiritual head crown and actually a physical crown that priests would wear that would show their office. So in the Old Testament, God is showing them that Israel is going to be full of kingly priests and that he's going to clothe them and they can take away that sin. So I want you to remember that, that as we move forward, we'll, we will be revisiting that in a little bit. Um, now, I told you we're going to be flipping a lot. Ephesians 4, 17 through 24 says, For this I say therefore and testify to the Lord that you from now on will walk not as the other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated uh, from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over to lasciviousness to work all uncleanliness with greediness, but have not so you have not so learned in Christ. Jesus is different than the world, right? So if it's that you've heard him and have been taught by him and the truth is in Jesus, then put off concerning the old former conversation and that word conversation literally can be translated behavior or conduct. The old man, put, over, uh, put off the former behavior of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness 
and true holiness. That's a garment change. So every time you hear put off and put on, think of being, you know, in the changing room and you're having to put off your old stuff. You know, you have to take that off and you have to put something else on. So that's much more better. <laughs> I'm just stripping. Woo! So you have to take it, uh, take off the old man. So many times we say things like, um, after we're saved or uh, and we've had you know time with the Lord, the Lord's starting to change us, and we we start to say things. Well, I always have been da 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 da. da. I used to say, well, you know. I've always had a short temper. I've always, I've never really been able to be patient. And, you know, that's my downfall. My dad's that way. My granddad's that way. And I would just kind of explain all this. But that's not true. I'm not, the, that's my old man. I have to put him off. I can't keep picking up my old man and trying to put him on. He doesn't fit anymore. Right? So we have to put on Christ. And the big key in the middle of this in the middle of your garment change is, is verse 23. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Um, in Ephesians 6, we, that's, you know, we'll be getting to that in the next sessions. Um, this session will really deals with the first three chapters of Ephesians, the second session, the last three. I'm kind of skipping back and forth because I really feel like we need to get this down inside of us in both sessions. But in Ephesians 6, just kind of a preview for you, you know, that's about the armor of God. And we go from being weak and ill-equipped to strong in the Lord and the power of his might because we're dressed in full armor. And so you have to, God loves layering. It's not something new that some fashionista like came up with. You know, there's, um, you know, there's robes of righteousness on underneath us, right, underneath this, this armor, right? And um, I wish I was an artist because I could draw like what I think this perfect, like well-dressed Christian looks like. But they have the robes of righteousness that are bought and paid for, completely ours. And then the Lord starts, boom, adding on armor on top of it. And so we are ready for any circumstance whatsoever. In um, Philippians 4, Paul called it um, those he discipled uh, the joy of and his crown. So we can see that, you know, even people can be a crown for us. We're talking all about spiritual crowns and spiritual gowns. So right now you may be thinking, I just want to fit in with everybody else, or I'm comfortable where I am. I just like to blend in. I don't need all this spiritual bling. See what I'm doing there? Um, but God made us to stand out. We are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people. If that doesn't say stand out, I don't know what does. So, John 18 and 36 says, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting, so it wouldn't be handed over to the, to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Why do you think the Lord says, when he teaches his disciples to pray, Thy kingdom come. It's a spiritual kingdom, and we carry it around inside of us. So, thy will be done on earth. This is earth. We're made of clay. Lord, let your will start here. Let me start walking out and living your will here, and so it can spread around me. Um, you know, one of my favorite stories, and actually I centered my book, uh, Chosen for Purpose, on it, is the story of David. And when he goes to battle Goliath, he does not go in Saul's armor. Saul tried to put his armor on him. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, I think Saul wanted credit. Because people maybe not, they wouldn't have known that it was David walking around in Saul's armor. I think the, the second thing I think is that Saul thought there's only one way to do things. But God doesn't think that way. Right? He uses the foolish things to confound the wise. But the thing that I love is that he put off the expectations of men and put on the expectations of God. And he went out dressed and prepared the way he had always worshipped God as himself. And he walked into what some considered a battle and really scary, but he saw as an opportunity for more. Um, if you follow through the whole story of David, like 
the way kings and kingdoms work, kingdoms pass from son to son. Father, son, father, son, father, son. But God was displeased with Paul, so David's going to come. And because God is such a legitimate God, he's not just going to usurp Saul and say, don't like you, David, it's your turn. No, he actually makes a way for David to become royalty. And David saw the opportunity. Because what was the reward when he walked down to take care of uh, Goliath? It was whoever defeated the Philistine could marry Saul's daughter. That's automatic royalty. So God was legitimizing David's claim to the throne. I just love that. I could geek out on that story forever. Um, but we have to put on Christ. Like David put on the Holy Spirit. He knew that he walked down into that battle and said, I don't come against you with a sword. I come against you in the name of the Lord. And that's how we have to live. We have to live inside the name of the Lord, inside Christ. Um, because he is the answer for everything. So, you know, if we need to overcome lust or vanity, we put on Christ like a garment. Rather than clothe ourselves, um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Rather, we clothe ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and don't we, we don't think about how we gratify our flesh. That's in Romans in 13, uh, 13 14. Uh, we need to understand our place in this world. Put on Christ. You know, if we, um, in Galatians 3, it says, for you are all sons, we're going to say daughters because this is a woman's group, we're all daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. Um, do you need to know how to interact with the world? Change your clothes. Um, if you are dressed, they say that clothes make the man, you know that phrase? You know, I really think that the clothes make the Christian. The spiritual clothes make the Christian. If we know who we are and we are dressed appropriately and we own what we're wearing, then we don't have to feel overwhelmed or, or consumed um, by the pressure of the world because we're confident. I like to call it Godfidence. You know, we are, because con means with um, in, in the Latin etymology days. So with God, all things are possible. Confidence in God, Godfidence. So there's my little hashtag for you today. Um, in Colossians, it says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Whew, that's a hard one. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving one another, as the Lord has forgiven you, so we must also forgive. And above all, all put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Here's another layered outfit. We have to put... Put on then, as God's chosen ones, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, and then love. Because no matter how well dressed the Christian is, if we don't have love it, to pull the whole outfit together, it will not work. It's 1 Corinthians 13 will be as a tinkling brass and a sounding cymbal. It's just noise. We're just another voice out there going, this is the way you need to live. And down the road, you know, at the airport, there's Harry Krishna saying the same thing. And around the corner up the forest road, there's a Buddhist temple. And they're saying, no, this is the way you need to live. So, like, if without love, there's no, the power of love overcomes everything. That's what Jesus proved on the cross. So, love is the thing that pulls our, our whole outfit together so to put these things on we must first undress we have to take take off the neglected and the forgotten because you're chosen you're not neglected you're not forgotten you have to take off the unworthy and the unloved i know that for me for a long long time i felt unworthy i felt unloved unlovable and the truth is i am much loved 
the Lord, for the Lord so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus didn't come to condemn the world because it was already dying. It was already dead. But he came to say through him that the world might be saved. So we have to take off hardness. Oh, this was a big one for me. I was super, super hard. Super mean. Um... I thought I was a tell it like it is kind of person, and uh, when I read the gifts of the spirit, and this is you know Christian, I when I read the gifts of the spirit, I knew I had to be a prophet. I couldn't be a teacher or anything else. I had to be a prophet because prophets tell it like it is. They don't have any mercy. You know, I was I was going to be, you know, here's the straight and the narrow. You know, and the truth is, I just had a cold hard heart, and I had to put it off. And I had to ask the Lord to crack that shell because it was thick. It was years of me trying to protect myself when all the Lord wanted me to do was open up so that he could wash me clean and make me soft and make me beautiful. Um, so you, we have to take off hardness. We have to let compassion soften us. I will never forget the moment where I said to Okay. Where I said to the Lord, and I'm getting really honest with you guys, I don't like people. I, Lord, I don't like people, and I know that's a problem with you because you are all about people. <laughs> that's in Ephesians 1, we read that He predestined before the foundations of time that we should be called holy and blameless once again, right? That all the Lord wanted was a family, and a family is consistent, it consists of people. So what am I going to do? I want to serve the Lord. But I got this thing where I don't like people. So the very first thing the Lord says, besides, okay, I got this, was go on a mission trip. And I really did not want to do that. But every time I wanted to hold myself back, I wanted to harden myself. In, in the middle of Guatemala, every time, God just knocked down that wall, knocked it down, broke it down, tore me down. And it's not a tearing down, when I say tear me down, he tore the old Dana down so that he could erect in its place, in her place, this beautiful, new, alive person that loved people. And I came back going, oh, that's what you mean. And it's been beautiful ever since. We have to take off apathy. That's what I had. I had a very hard heart, a very apathetic, you know, aspect about how I looked at people. Um, we have to find Cain. Uh, kindness and drape it on instead. Um, I was over at my friend's house and um, kind of like it is in this church right now, she likes to keep it very cold. Um, and so her children who are very little little and skinny, you know, they're like 10 and 7 or yeah, 10 and 7, 9 and 7 somewhere, yeah, 10 and 7. They walk around, they look like Obi-Wan Kenobi, you know, like they're, they have a blanket draped over them and they're wrapped up and they're walking around like this, you know. And, um, but that's kind of how I feel like kindness has to be draped over us. So that um, it's not us that they see. Because what does it say in the Bible? That the kindness and the goodness of God is what draws men to repentance. And if kindness is draped over every aspect of us and we're completely wrapped up in it, then what people see is God. We have to take off pride, and we have to discover the beauty of humility, meekness, and patience. Whew. I, those are still where it being worked out in me. I'm just going to be honest. You know, it, it, being there's nothing that God will ask us to be. Absolutely nothing He will ask us to be that He is not. And that concept kind of blew me away at first because I was like, "Well, you ask us to be humble," and God just kind of waited for the other shoe to drop in my brain. Like, oh, because you're humble. He really is. Because what does he ask us to do? He asks us to bring him the glory. He doesn't stand up in heaven and go, I am the greatest. <laughs> you know, he doesn't shout that from heaven. He wants us to respond in love to him and bring that to him. So he really is humble and he asks us to be humble. Um, when we understand kingdom living, it means that living in a community we bear with one another, even when it's not convenient to do so. 
Um, we f forgive and we're gracious, just like the Lord forgives. Um, above all, we have to put on love. Um, because otherwise, your outfit's just going to look wackadoo. You're going to look crazy. You're, you know, um, my mother was an original person. She was born in the 50s, raised in the 60s, really came into her own in the 70s. And she was hippie from the word go. And even in her 50s, before she died, she was very eccentric. Eccentric, sorry. Um, Lisp for the win. And she would uh, dress herself in the most, what I thought was god awful outfits. Like, we're talking a red pencil skirt with this really bright printed paisley shirt and a big brocade kind of hat with gold chain around it and the thing that pulled the purple and the red and the print and the, all the stuff was maybe a tiny little belt and a ring and to her those things made everything not look wacky meanwhile all of us were looking going oh my gosh she looks like an easter egg on steroids you know <laughs> I, I love her i love her she's gone to be with jesus um but I just never really got the way she dressed. And I think sometimes that that is, we think we're walking around looking like the good Christian. We think because we don't cuss and we, and we um, say all the right things and we listen to the right radio station and um, we have, you know, these things that we do, that that's okay, that's good enough. And I'm not saying that if you're hearing me that you're not a good Christian. What I'm saying is there's so much more. There's so much deeper. There's so much wider. There's, there's no end to God's grace. There's no end to his love. When we wrap ourselves and when we fully submerge ourselves in his grace and in his love, then how we walk towards the world completely changes. And it's not just stuff we do. It's who we are. And I think that that's a difference because, you know, I hear a lot of, well, I'm Christian now. I don't listen to that. Or I'm a Christian now, I don't drink. I, I'm a Christian now, um, I don't go to R-rated movies. I'm a Christian now, so um, this is how I discipline my children. I'm a Christian now, so this is. And it's like this list of this for that, tit for tat. It's I am, so I do. And I want us to get to the place where we realize I just am. There's this beautiful song. I don't even know who wrote it. I think it's Hill's song. And it's called Good, Good Father. And it says, you're a good, good father. That's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I don't have to be anything else except loved. Everything I am is wrapped up in that. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead because I kind of did that already. Um, don't you love when I can turn more than one page at a time? So, um, so I said all that so that we can go over what crowns are. Now, I'm going to start with the definition of crowns according to Wikipedia, which has resources like the Webster Dictionary, um, the Royal Family of England, and all this other stuff that have contributed to these wiki pages. According to Wikipedia, And I want you to put on your spiritual ears so that you can hear this. Crowns are a traditional symbolic form of headgear worn by a monarch or kingly priest. Or deity were the daughters of the living God, who is the king of kings and lord of lords, for whom the crown traditionally represents. Now this is still according to Wikipedia. Power, legitimacy, victory, triumph, honor, and glory, as well as immortality, righteousness, and resurrection. That is the worldly definition of what a crown represents. Now let's apply that spiritually. Power, in the name of Jesus, we have power in Christ. Legitimacy, no longer orphans, no longer bastards, no longer alone, we're adopted, we're grafted into the vine. Victory, we're crowned with victory because of the complete work of Christ. Triumph, Jesus made an open show of the devil. He says to us, you are more than conquerors. 
Um, we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of Christ. Honor and glory. Those I have called, I have justified. Those I justify, I glorify, it says in Romans. As well as immortality. We have life everlasting. These are what crowns represent. Righteousness. Right standing with the king and with the body. Think about that in the natural. If the king says you can still wear your crown in the natural, that means a prince can walk around and it's an immediate symbol that, one, the king still approves of him, and two, the populace around him, the people he rules in the natural, must respect him because of his office, his place. So we are spiritually, we're in right standing with the king and with the body. And resurrection in Jesus, we have life, newness, um, the old is gone, but we put on the new. So there are type, types of crowns within the kingdom. So there's a crown of joy. I want you to write these down, these, these scriptures, if you have a pen and paper, so that you can um, look at this later. Proverbs 12, 4, it says, A virtuous woman, or an excellent wife, in the English uh, standard version, is a crown to her, to her husband. We can bring joy to others' lives. A crown of knowledge, um, Proverbs 14, 18. The simple inherit folly, but the prudent are crowned with knowledge. A crown of wisdom, Proverbs 14, 24. The crown of the, rise of the wise is their riches. And remember when I said in the beginning of this course, anytime I say riches, I want you to immediately think inheritance. The crown of the wise is their inheritance, but the foolishness of fools is folly. A crown of legacy. I mentioned this earlier. Uh, you, it, Proverbs 17, 6, and in Philippians 4, 1. Grandchildren are a crown to an old man, and glory uh, of children are, uh, are their fathers. And it, that's a Proverbs 17, 6. And in Philippians 4, 1, that's where Paul says, All of you that I've led to the Lord, that I've discipled, that I've taught are my joy and crown. So we can leave legacy, not only through our family, but through those we minister to and with. A crown of beauty in Isaiah 28, 5. In that day, um, and that scripture is talking about when Jesus is finally here in the New Testament living, not in the Old Testament living. Shall the Lord of hosts be a crown and glory for the diadem of beauty, or diadem, rather, of beauty. And a diadem is a jeweled crown that announces royalty. So even in the Old Testament, they knew that when Christ came, we were going to get a crown. Um, a crown of glory. Um, and the word glory in this um, scripture, we're going to turn to it, is Isaiah 62 and 3. The word for glory, it actually also means recovered, repurposed, redeemed in the Hebrew. Thou shalt be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. I, I it, it's talking about being a crown. It's talking about being crowned. Um, we're no longer forsaken. We're no longer desolate. Um, In, if we keep reading, it says, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, neither shall the land be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah, for the Lord delights in thee, and thy land shall be merry. And Hephzibah actually means, My delight is in her. And Beulah means married, or it conveys a transformation. When you go from being unmarried to married, there is a transformation in, inside. Um, so we don't have to be alone. We don't have to feel unbeautiful. God is delighting in us. He actually sings over us. You know, and there are, there are times when, uh, again, that song comes to mind, that Good, Good Father song. It says um, that I have heard all the things they say about you, God. But I have laid in my bed at night and I've heard you whisper how you delight in me and how much you love me. And that is relationship. It's, it's God saying, I'm going to crown you with delight. 
Um, so from here on, there's laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the original judge, shall give me in heaven, and not only me, but to all those who also were love was, you know, when, when we loved, like, Jesus is here. Boom. Oh, I'm so excited. Like, rapture. We're gone. We're in heaven. Here's a crown because you were excited that I was coming. I mean, God's just going to be handing out crowns. A little bit later in the story, we're going to go, Psh, we don't deserve these, and we throw them at his feet, right? So, but for now, while we're living here, you know, that crown will be later. But there are so many crowns we just talked about. Uh, crowns of glory and honor. Jesus showed us how to rule and re uh, reign over ourselves. Hebrews 2, 7 and 9. Um, and... A leadership crown, 1 Peter 5, uh, 4, when we replicate purpose in others. Um, let's, let's turn to that, 1 Peter. Which, as old as my Bible is, I still... Oh, man. Lord, I need a new Bible. Um, okay, 1 Peter 5. Which is the page I tore out. Huh? Okay, four. Uh, let's read one through four. The elders which are among you I exhort, whom also I am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not by filthy lucre. Don't do it just for the money. You know, so many ministers out there that are doing it for the fame and the glory and the money, and it just makes me sick. But with a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd will appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Um, go back to verse 2. Feed the flock. What did Jesus say to Peter um, by the seashore? If you love me, feed my sheep. So what does Peter do here, through the next few years? I mean, he's well on when he read the, when he writes the epistles of First and Second Peter. He's well on in his life. It's before he's um, getting close to the time where he's actually crucified, and he says, "Feed one another." He's replicating in other people the calling God put on his life, and what's it going to be counted to him later? A crown of glory. I mean, that is a crown of leadership. The crown of life. Um, when we face death, we're appointed life. In um, Revelations 2.10, even in the face of death, we're given life. Um, Revelations 3.10 through 11, um, and in Job 7, um, excuse me, Job 2.7 and Job 19.9, um, in Revelations it says, Behold, I'm coming quickly. Make sure no man takes your crown. While you're waiting for me, make sure no one takes your crown. And then in the story of Job, we see where Satan goes and he smites Job from the bottom of his feet to the crown of his head. And over and over and over again, what is he trying to steal? Job, uh, Job's identity, who he is, his relationship with God. Because that's what God was bragging on, was his relationship with, with him, with Job's relationship with God. It's like, have you considered my, my servant Job? It's not that <coughs> God wanted Job to suffer. He just knew that the relationship was so strong that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what you're going through, what Job was going through, he would honor God and he would not lose who he was in relationship to God. And that's where we have to get. We have to get to the place where we realize we are not going to lose relationship. We know who we are. <clears throat> um, Jesus wore a crown of thorns so that we could wear many crowns so that one day when we get into heaven we can throw them all before him and say Lord it's all yours it was all for you it was all because of you thank you so much Here, what you've given us we give back to you I've talked about um, not liking clothes I've talked about not liking to change clothes. Ugh. And why do we make dressing rooms so hot? I 
just don't understand. Um, but no one is mo more surprised than I that I'm talking about being ready in season and out of season. And every time I think of the word season, I'm a big fan of, of some of those, like, what not to wear. I hated when it went off the air. You know, I love watching people, like, get dressed for different seasons. But God says to be dressed or to be ready in season and out of season. And I want to be dressed and prepared for whatever God's got. The clothes, we talked about crowns. Now I want to talk about the spiritual gowns. I want to talk about the clothes in which our Father dresses us. Uh, every time I want, you hear the word new gown, robe, mantle, or piece of clothing, I want you to think immediately garment change. Um, I first, though, I want to talk about being naked. <laughs> I know that's weird. Um, and I, I just want you to follow along with me. Adam and Eve, we talked about them in the beginning. We'll keep talking about them through the course of this, this class. They walked with God in the evenings, and they managed a large garden full of every kind of fruit, vegetable, and animal. They were naked the whole time. One, because, you know, the temperature was perfect. And um, the other was because they didn't have any self-awareness before sin. Right? It wasn't until sin entered the world that self even became a thing. Their identity, who they were, it was part of the garden. It was part of God's creation. It was part of the relationship of everything around them with God. And until sin came in, their eyes were on two things. Fellowship with God, the Father, and the job he gave them to do. All this is yours. Go replenish the earth, manage the animals. Just don't eat of that tree or that tree. And sin brought an awareness of their own state. It full, flooded them with shame, and it brought to them the need to supply themselves with something God never intended. God, if he, God intended for them to be clothed, right? If he intended for them to be, you know, to, to have a need to be covered, he would have sown the fig leaves himself. I'm pretty sure God probably would have done a much better job of it, you know? And I'm, I'm speaking metaphorically. We don't, you know, but I want you to understand the moment that Adam and Eve sinned, humanity focused on self more than it focused on God. And more hu the more humanity focuses on self, the more alone and lost we feel. God never intended for the eyes of our understanding to be inward. That's why in the, in the Gospels it says, make your eyes singularly focused. Look at God. So sin did that. Sin made them look inside. I call them navel gazers. And even as Christians, we can be navel gazers. You know, you, you're navel. Hello. You know, you're always looking inward. I wish I could bend over and look at my, <laughs> my belly. But, but, you know, they're always looking down like going, what's going on with me? I've got to find myself. I've got to, I've got to get, you know, what my head space on right. And I've got to figure out what's going on with me. I mean, that is a load of bull hockey. I'm sorry. I mean, God calls us. He makes us his own. He fills us with the spirit. He calls us to go. He never says, while you're going, take time and look at yourself. No, he says, look at me. Follow me. Run after me. Press towards the mark of the high calling of Christ Jesus. Look for the finish line. Lay your treasure up in heaven. Seek me first with uh, all you have. And I'll add all the rest of the stuff to you. And Jesus had to preach to people, don't care about what you wear. I'll clothe you. Don't care about what you eat. I'll feed you. So this, all this worry and anxiety that we deal with, I, I am a firm believer. This comes from the sin nature, and that's not embracing who we are. Because if we knew who we are, why would we worry about Bill? Why would we worry about whether or not we get to take a trip across the country or not, if it's God's will, there will be a, make, you know, a way will be made. Why are we worried about whether or not our kids have food? God does not leave his children begging bread. He will provide. All we have to do is obey him, follow after him, love him. He provides everything else. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added. I'm not preaching a, a prosperity message. I don't want you to hear that where I'm saying, you know, you'll be rich in this life. I'm obviously not a, a financially well-off person 
compared to other people, but compared in my neighborhood, but compared to people across in another continent in Africa, I am rich. And you cannot sit there and look at your circumstances and make that, make your relationship with God predicated on that. You can't do that. You can't say, well, if, if the Lord really was going to show me favor, my pocketbook would be bigger. That's that too. Sorry, bull hockey. We have to understand that we cannot put limits on God. We have, our job, pay our tithe, obey him, give, feed the hungry. What does it say in Isaiah? This is the fast I've chosen for you. This is what I've called you to do. And this is what Jesus said to John the Baptist when John the Baptist asked him, um, are you the Christ? He said, the naked are clothed, the poor are getting fed, the sick are getting healed. That's the fast I have chosen for you. He's quoting out of Isaiah. And he's affirming, I am who I say I am. And if he is who we, he says he was, and he has done all of that, and we are in him now, in Christ, why are we having anxiety? Why are we so worried? There's freedom there. So, <clears throat> sorry, a little bit of a rabbit trail. But I said it to make sure that you understand that God never intended for our inner eyes to look inward. Sin did that. So God made a way to cover us with something more substantial than with fig leaves, even more substantial than animal skins or cotton later. He covers us with his grace. We can be clothed because, the garment change, uh, because of the garment changes that Jesus himself underwent. Um, first, let me take a drink. God put on flesh. He took a garment change. Jesus put on flesh, came to earth in the form, uh, in the form of a man. Then, at crucifixion, they stripped him bare of all of his clothes, and they put on a scarlet robe. And they placed a crown of thorns on his head, and they mocked him. And I believe each one of these things is important. They signify Jesus having a garment change. One moment he was God in heaven, then man on earth in the form of a babe. Then 33 years later, his kingship is acknowledged, and his sonship has already been affirmed. Remember in the, when John the Baptist baptized Jesus. He said, this is my son and whom I will please. Sonship was already affirmed. Now, he's about to be crucified. They put a scarlet robe on him, a crown of thorns. His kingship is affirmed. Then, after all the mocking and all the acknowledgement, they redress him in his own clothes, signifying that he was fully human sacrifice for us. So, and that you can read about that in Matthew 27, 28 through 31. So the Lord dresses Jesus in humanity so that on the cross, when it is stripped away, his holy kingship would be the thing that's remaining. And that's what makes him worthy of being our Savior. That's the grace of our Father. Garment changes in the Bible are everywhere, and they usually depict a change in spiritual status. Like the prodigal son, he was outside of his father's grace and his will, and outside of his father's household, and then he was in. Um... Let's turn to Mark 10. I really should tab this, but if I did, my Bible would be full of little post-it tabs and I'd get so confused. I used to be blonde. <laughs> um, Matthew, Matthew, Mark, that's what I said to turn to, Mark 10. Okay, pages sticking together. We're going to read verses 46 through 52. And they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the highway side begging. And when he heard that all the commotion around him was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. And they charged him, shh, be quiet, yeah, shush up. And he cried all the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stood still and he commanded him to be called. Now I want you to hear garment change in three, two, one. And they called the blind man saying to him, be of good comfort, 
Rise, he calls thee. And immediately he cast away his garments. And he rose and he came to Jesus. And Jesus answered him and said, What do you want that I will do for you? And the blind man said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in the way. So I want you to understand that the garment of a beggar, because that's how you can recognize who's a beggar, they had a certain thing they wore, came to, and he threw it off and he came to Jesus as a man of worth. He understood immediately that if he was going to encounter the Lord of the universe, that it was going to immediately impart into him worth. And he no longer had to be a beggar. He no longer had to ask for scraps. He no longer had to sit under the table and wait for something to drop. He could walk right up to his dad and go, Lord, I need this. I, I, I want to fellowship with you. And out of that fellowship, I want to live off of every word that comes out of your mouth. He recognized that Jesus did more than just restore the physical. He recognized that Jesus did more than just heal. He actually restored identities too. I want us to think about that Peter that um, we talked about, the one that on uh, the beach. Before the cross, Peter was harsh, quick-tempered, fearful, and easily swayed. He had moments when we glimpsed the greatness in him that God saw from the start, but for the most part, Peter just didn't always get it. He was just kind of numb. Like one minute he's saying, you are the Christ. And the next minute he says, no, Lord, I don't want them to crucify you. And Jesus is saying, get behind me, Satan. Like he just really wasn't quite on script. He didn't quite get it. But the night before the crucifixion, Peter even denied Jesus. He was cussing up a storm. And Jesus, but when Jesus resurrected, he went out of his way to see Peter and restore him in Matthew 26, 75. And I want to, y'all don't have to re turn over there, but I'm going to. Um, it's one of my favorite moments in all of the Bible because I identify with it so strongly. There are so many people that say, oh, I'm Peter. I just say what's on, y'all. I just, I get in trouble all the time. Foot and mouth, foot and mouth. And we have to understand Peter didn't stay that person. He didn't stay that person that always said the wrong thing, always did the wrong thing. And it all started on a beach in Matthew 26, 75. And Peter, um, well, this is when Jesus was asking him, you know, I have the wrong scripture. Okay, so I'm just going to wing it because that's the wrong thing. Uh, I don't know why I wrote that. Sorry. So when... Uh, Oh, it's in John, sorry. John 21, I'll read that. Here it is. Yay, found it. There's grace, thank you, Lord. Um, on a beach, Peter, after the crucifixion, he's like, I don't know what to do now. I mean, they have seen Jesus in an upper room. Lord just appears behind a locked door. He's walked on the road with with Jesus, all of these things are going on. Peter's been there every time. But where does he have to go to find Peter to restore him? Peter dropped everything, even after seeing all of it. Knowing that Jesus was re resurrected, Peter went back to fishing because he didn't know what to do after this. So Jesus goes to the beach and he says, Um, Here it is. Cast on it. Okay. So as soon as they were come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there, and Jesus had laid the fish on the bread. And he said, come, dine with me. I'm skipping down now. And this, it says that this was the third time that Jesus had showed himself to his disciples. Like, this should not be a surprise to the guys by now. And he turns to Peter after they ate, and he said, Simon Peter, son of Jonas, do you love me more than all of these? And I have to believe he's not just talking about all the people there. He's talking about his past. He just got off of his boat, the one that he owned before Jesus, 
the one that he still owns now, the one that he was about to return to, the one that was safe, the one that he knew he could make a living off of, the one that he knew he probably wouldn't have to die for. Do you love me more than your life? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And he says, feed my sheep. And he says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. Love you. And he said, feed my sheep. And he said unto him a third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he was like, why doesn't the Lord believe me? Yes, I love you. He said, then feed, he said unto him, Lord, that you know everything. You know I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. And he says, verily I say unto you, when you were young, you girded yourself. You put on your own belt. You got dressed. You were your own person. But, and you walked wherever you wanted. But when you, were old, when you are old, you will stretch forth your hands and another will gird thee. I'll dress you. And I'll take, the Holy Spirit will take you where you wouldn't normally go. Now he didn't know that this was going to be the Holy Spirit. But he understood Jesus was saying something powerful. And this he spoke signifying the death which would glorify God. And when he said all he had to say, Jesus simply said, follow me. And what I love about that is that when Jesus met Peter for the first time, he looked at him and said, I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. So the same phrase that started that journey was the last thing Jesus said to Peter. Follow me. Do what I do. Do what I've done. Love like I've loved. Live like I lived. And eventually die like I died. We cannot get so stuck in our past and in our sin that we let that define us. Peter was so caught up in the fact that he denied Jesus three times that it grieved him that he thought Jesus might not really know that he loved him. Yes, he messed up. But he wanted Jesus to know, I do love you. And so the immediate response of the Lord is, feed my sheep. So Jesus worked hard to restore Peter to his identity and to his purpose. We talked about purpose last week. So what did Jesus read in the temple of Nazareth, Isaiah 61? There's a garment change in the middle of it. Put on the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. He said, you know, I will crown you with beauty for ashes. So we are carrying the dead weight of our sin, but once Jesus took the sin of our cross, uh, sin on the cross and he died not just for us but as us, the heaviness lifted in exchange. We're clothed in a garment so light that our hearts and our hands and even our very lives can raise and worship to God. In Luke 8, we see that Jesus physically clothed someone he had first set free. And that's the story of the demoniac outside of the Decapolis. Decapolis is like an area, a region of ten cities. And there was this guy that was infamous. He was so full of demons, they called them legion. And he was such, he broke through chains. He broke through, you know, mortar. He, he would cut himself with stones. He was just raging in foam at the mouth. Everyone knew him. Everyone stayed clear. And he was naked as the day he was born because he couldn't stand to have anything touch him. He was so consumed by the, by the demons. And so Jesus sets him free. And the next thing we know in Luke 8, this guy's sitting next to Jesus fully clothed. And some people from the town walk by and they go, Isn't that that guy? Why is he sitting there all clothed? And like listening, he's not throwing a fit. And it freaked him out so much, they went up to Jesus and said, you got to go. Like, I don't know what you did to him, but it, we're freaked out by that. You got to go. And the guy was like, I want to go with you. I have never been so free. I have never felt so loved. I have, he knew immediately he was changed. He had a garment change. And the, Jesus looks at him and says, no, it's better that you stay here. I want you to go and tell everyone. Now, that, that was the first time Jesus had gone to Decop the Decapolis, the, the ten cities, that area. The next time Jesus comes, 
There's revival over. People are getting healed. People are getting saved. People are getting set free. I, it is a huge deal. This is where, this is the area where Jesus crossed over uh, from when he was feeding the 5,000 and feeding the 10,000. All of that stuff happened in that area. So, <clears throat> it all happened because there was an inward change in a guy and someone saw the outward evidence of it. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the, the prodigal son. And I want to I want to ask you a question. And some of you may have heard this preached before. But what about the other brother? In verse 31, he says, I've been here this whole time. And you never thrown a party for me. You never put a special robe on me or a special ring. And he was very hurt. He was very upset. But what the father made him realize is that he had inheritance all along. He just refused to walk in it. What a sad state is that. If we have inheritance, and we do, but we refuse to walk in it. What does that look like? Does it look like sickness? Does it look like um, trouble in our marriages? Does it look like financial issues? And when we don't walk in inheritance, when we don't walk in the fullness, there will be trouble. This We're in the world. Jesus was very clear. As long as you're in the world, there's going to be problems. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And everything I've done, you'll do, and more. And everything I did for you now gives you access to the Father. And you can go straight to him and ask now. So it's all about inheritance and walking in the fullness of our identity. It's signified by the crowns and the spiritual gowns I've been talking about. We have to know who we are. So we have to throw off the old garments. Now, really quickly, um, we're going to go back to Ephesians 2, and pretty much we're going to stay there for the rest of this, this uh, class. Um, we had, I'm checking the time, um, I have a timer here, there's a clock up there, but I'm making sure that I'm on track here. Um, Ephesians 2 is where we're going to be for the rest of the class, mostly. <coughs> we had an identity outside of Christ. It was false, and it was an assumed identity. It was attach, attached to us by our sin nature. It was assigned because of the curse. In our past, we walked according to the standards and the ways of the world. We looked like and acted like everyone else. I know I did. You couldn't tell me from anybody. You know, I partied hardied with the, the best of them, right? But our influences were spiritual. They were led by our enemy and evident in the people around us. We behaved in, path, in the past according to our lusts. The lust of our flesh, the pride of uh, life, the pride of our eyes. We're ruled by our bodies and by our corrupt mindsets. We were negative, pessimistic, angry, wantonous, prideful, insecure, hopeless, and all of that left us feeling completely unworthy. Those are all lies from the devil that we accepted in the world because we didn't know any better. In every thought and action, we were bruising our souls. We were wounding our conscience, uh, our conscience, and we were searing our hearts. And the thing about it is, is that we were taught about ourselves that we should feel shame, that we should feel fear, anxiety, upset, when we need to know that God loved us so much that he erased it all. So I want you to understand that you are loved, that that is your identity. There is nothing outside of love that you have to ever look for or find. Everything is in the fact that God is love. You are loved. In Ephesians 2, 4 through 5, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sin, quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. When I see that word quicken, I think of um, that old show ER. You know, or uh, there's other medical shows since then, I'm sure. I'm kind of dating myself. Um, you know, the paddles, they, they warm up those paddles and they clear, <laughs> life, quicken. And you know, the heartbeat would come again. And that's what I see when I think of us being quickened with Christ. 
we were dead, Christ, woo, alive. You know? I mean, that's what I think of. <clears throat> I have authority. Let's read verse 6. And he hath raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. With, in Jesus Christ. In him. Not with him. In him. We are so hidden in Christ. The blood of Jesus washes us. We, the mercy seat is full of the blood of Jesus, constantly covering our sins, that we do not have to be outside of Christ. When Satan comes knocking on our door, he's going to look. She's got to be in there somewhere. I see a light on. No, can't find her. You know why? I was hidden in Christ the whole time. Couldn't see me because all I saw was Christ and he ain't messing with him. Okay? Uh, we are called to sit together in heavenly places. Recall our last uh, lesson when we talked about um, he, wherewith he called us to sit with him, to rule and reign with Christ. Um, I'm rich in his grace. Let's read verse 7. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. We will never reach an end to the grace of the Lord. Um, let's look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 18 really quick. For by grace you are saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, that anybody can boast about it. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ unto good works, which God hath already uh, before ordained that we should walk in them. Therefore remember that you being in the past Gentiles in the flesh, who were the uncircumcision, are now called the circumcision in the flesh, uh, is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers of the covenant of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now, in Christ, you have sometime, you who were sometimes afar off are now made right and close by the blood of Jesus. This is the adoption process. We are being infused with Christ, for he is our peace who has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now there is no difference between those who were in covenant before the Jews and us. God has made a way for all men to come into him, having abolished in his flesh, flesh the enmity, sin, which was the law of the commandment contained in the ordinances, for to make himself out of two things one new man, out of the house of Israel and out of Israel, I mean, out of Israel and out of the rest of the world, the heathens, the Gentiles, now there's just in Christ. That he might reconcile both to God in one body by the cross, cross, having slain the enmity but thereby, and came and preached peace which were to you who were afar off and to them that were close. And through him we both have access by the Spirit to the Father. All things are made new. All the... All that things that were dead and passed away are gone. Life is quickened again by the Spirit. We are now adopted. The emptiness that we felt before is now filled with Christ. We are reconciled. Um, reconciliation is an act of bringing all things back together into balance. The act of finishing, uh, uh, the, the finished act of the cross changed everything spiritually back. But if we look at a bank account, we reconcile it, right, by checking off the deficits and the deposits. How many of you reconcile and check a book? <laughs> one, one of us. Um, now with apps and stuff, we can kind of see like where our money is and what we can spend and can't spend. Can't spend. So a lot of times we don't even reconcile our checkbook. But I know that when I was um, a kid, like you had to take uh, accounting in high school. It was like you had to know how to balance your checkbook. So we reconcile it by checking off deficits and deposits. But us, sin wiped us out. We weren't just, you know, a little in the hole. We were in a debt so big, there was no way we could pay it. So God paid the debt, and he brought us back. And Ephesians 1.4 says, blameless and holy. He didn't just bring us back to zero. He filled us with worth. Zero is blameless, but holy is worth. So he not only reconciles us, he says, and here's a little extra. I love that. 
The riches of our Father, our inheritance, goes farther than just bringing us back to zero. I just said that. So we're going to skip. Love when I get ahead of myself. <clears throat> we are works of art. In Ephesians 2.10, it says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Uh, remember that song? He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. This is the thing. Like, it blows my mind. The finished work of the cross, we're new in him, but there's so much he wants to build, he wants to create. He's still a creative God, and he's still designing things. And there's things he, he predestined to design in us, but the more we yield to him, like clay, I don't know if any of you have ever worked with clay. I used to sculpt as a hobby, and clay is really cold and really hard, and you have to literally pound it and work it in your hands and get the heat of your hands, make the clay warm, and then you can start to shape it. Um, and it's not an easy process, and there's something there that could definitely be preached about later. But out of that clay can come real beauty. Um, the David the, um, by Michelangelo took two years to sculpt, and it's considered by most in, uh, um, artists or, or appreciators of art aficionados, that's the, word I, uh, the phrase I was looking for, to be like the perfect example of art. Um, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper took four years each. A modern example of the Statue of Liberty took 14 years to construct. So God has been planning, designing, crafting, honing, and perfecting you since before we even counted time. He predestined us. So he's been working on your masterpiece for a long time, but you're not finished. So you have to keep submitting to him. You have to be like that clay and let his love warm you and make you soft and yielding. And then he can keep making you, know, you amazing, making you something new, making you something different. Um, our change starts the minute we get saved, but if there's uh, an art opportunity for us to do something we should do it change doesn't matter unless it is like form without function form if, if something's just pretty it's it's really very useless but if something is pretty and it can do something it changes the way we do things in our lives uh, i'll never forget when swiffer came out I know it, it's like some of you are saying Swiffer's always been around, kind of like the internet. It hasn't. Um, but I remember, I was like, that is awesome. I want that. And it changed the way I lived my life. But we have to be the same. We have to be form and function. God has appointed before time good works for us to do. If you have that thing, you see someone hungry, feed them. You see someone naked, clothe them. There are certain things that are going to speak to you more than they're going to speak to me. Say, you know, you're in a neighborhood where you know people are hungry. And God gives you an idea of how to do a food pantry and do it. And you know what I'm saying? Like, God's got purposes and good works for you. They're going to be different than the good works that I do. But each one of us are assigned. I'm known and I'm wanted. Let's look at verse uh, 11. Uh, well, we just read it. So 11 through 22 talks about before you were outside of Christ. Now you're inside of Christ. Before you were a bastard, you, you were outside of Israel. You were not wanted. You were separate. You're the kind of people that we sent Israel against. You know, there was enmity. There was a separation. There was, you know, we were not pleased with you before because you were not in relationship. But now... I, and, and then I always wanted you, but now there's a way. Now I can adopt you. Now I can bring you back. Now you're in um, relationship with me. I'll establish my covenant between you and me. Um, God knew you, but he, you could not know God because the way to him was through Jesus, and there was no way then. then. But now there is. So where there was a division, now we have oh, access. 
The cosmic mystery of God's holy divinity and his complete humanity coming together to make one person, which brought peace to the world, is what Paul is talking about here. We no longer need to be at war with who we were are either, who we were designed to be. I know um, I've been at war with my personality. I, I have I've thought I'm too loud. I've been told in my life, shh, Dana, you're too loud. Sit down, shut up. You know, Dana, no, don't do that. You know, ugh, she's too much. I, I've heard, I cannot tell you how many times I've heard in my life, that girl is too much. I mean, now when I hear it, I'm like, yeah, because God adds to me and I get it. But before I was just looking at my personality and it, it wounded me because I was like, well, if God made me this way. But what I didn't understand is, yes, God made me with a big personality, but I had let so much sin and sin nature be heaped up and mixed in and marbled in, kind of like a marble cake when you overstir it, it just becomes chocolate. You know, I, like it was so mixed up in there that I didn't know the difference. And it was when I got where, to a place where I was submitted to God that God been, began to say, this is your personality. This is what you let your past do to it. So let's strip this past away. Let me clean it, make it new and, and beautiful. And what's left, I'm more comfortable with. I can walk in it. I can own it. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I'm not going around foisting it off on people just to prove that I'm okay. Um, I used to say things like, you either love me or you hate me. Um, and that's still, to some extent, very true. But the difference between then and now is, I don't care now. I don't care if you don't love me. I know I'm loved. That's the difference. So... I want you to know that you are loved. God is not mad with you, mad at you. He is not upset with you. He is not um, displeased. He created you. He's molded you. He's made you. And now he wants to take you to the next place to know that, that no matter what you are loved, there is nothing you can do to make him love you more. There's nothing you can do to make him love you less. Father, I just thank you that you love us, that you love us so perfectly and so completely, that that is exactly who we are. We are loved. We are your beloved. Father, I thank you, Lord, that all the walls that we erect, you can crash through with your love, that you can cover us, that you can wrap us, that you can dress us, that you can clothe us, that you can crown us with your love. And when you do, it's the same as if you crown us with beauty, because you see the beauty inside of us that you created us to be. You see everything that we have need of before we ever ask, and you make it available inside of your love. Father, seal it inside of us. By the Holy Spirit, seal it inside of us that we are loved. And that inside that love, that we can then open ourselves up to that love. Don't let us be hard-hearted like I was. But let us open up and say, I surrender. Like, a, make us go from hard chunk of clay to warm, soft, yielded clay that you can work with. Seal in us, Father God, who we are, that we are yours, that there is nothing that we can do, nothing in our past. And I have got a past. I've got a past full of abuse and rejection and rebellion and adultery and horrible circumstances. And Lord, you saw the value in me anyway. And you love me. So show us that no matter what our past looks like, you have us. No matter what our present looks like, whether there is 
financial problems or problems with our kids or health issues or doubt, fear, unbelief. Lord, blast it with your love and completely wipe it out. Lord, I used to think that scripture that says vengeance is mine, says the Lord, was you going to fight all the people that were in my way, all the people I was mad at that had done me wrong. But what I realize now, Lord, is when it, it when there is something that stands in the way of love, you go to war against it. Because you want to love us. And you do love us. And anything that stands in the way, our own unforgiveness, our own pride, our own doubt, whatever that is, you go to war against it so that we can feel your love. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. That's who I am. Thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thanks for coming and staying. Um, oh, right on time. Awesome.